how do you think about business and marketing? And you know, so why do you think that your thinking has helped so many companies over the decades? Because it's helped a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, the answer is probably grounded, founded in what I'm the strongest at. I've had the unexpected good fortune of, of being involved in over a thousand industries uh, worldwide, not businesses. And it's given me an enormously broad, deep and uniquely uh, expansive understanding of all that's possible uh, all the possible in business strategy, business models, marketing, advertising, value creation, strategic alliances, a lot of things that most people who spend a life in one or two industries wouldn't fathom. And I've gotten to try out an enormous amount of hypothesis and and beliefs into the real market. And I've had to do it through translation on worldwide sort of uh uh, forums and it's given me an understanding of things that um, transcend the way most people think about it. I've got a much more expansive sense of what you can do, how you can do it, where you can do it, why you can do it, what all is possible. And most people just don't have the they don't have the empirical experience to understand and appreciate more possibilities. So one of the things that you talk about. Um is to look for solutions to business problems, but within other like industries. You know, so why is that so important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. First of all, if you study breakthroughs throughout history, the majority of them did not come from inside the industry. They came from outside. People would look at something and realize they could translate it or apply it to a totally different application. Easy examples, fiber optics, re define telecommunication, but it wasn't created in telecommunication. It came from aerospace and somebody borrowed it and adapted and adopted it. Federal Express created a whole industry by borrowing from the United States, the hub and spoke check clearing process that the Federal Reserve Bank, our bank, our banking system used to make sure people didn't bounce checks. Uh, Rogaine came from uh, pimple medicine. Viagra came from heart medicine. Uh, ballpoint pen. I don't have worth my pen. I've lost my pen temporarily. <laughs> ballpoint pen or roll-on deodorant was borrowed from each other. So that's the first distinction. The second is the concept of best practices is frankly and actually flawed because Usually you're, start, you're learning the best practices from a, an, a, a vertical industry. And by and large, they're going to be incremental. They're going to be incremental. They're not going to be explosive practices. They're things that everyone else is doing a little bit better, worse, best practices. They're not the best breakthrough practices. They're not the highest, best, safest, fastest, most profitable, efficient, effective uh, they're, they're just the best practices that an industry has discovered. When I got started, I realized, excuse me, I'm on a, a air, air, airport and right on the runway and a lot of planes take off. I learned that there's a lot of higher, better, faster, safer, more powerful, profitable, productive ways to do things that other industries do commonplace, but people in a different industry are never even exposed to. So it's much, it's sort of there's the basis for it. And so you talked about um, explosive growth, right? And, you know, you often talk about um, the fact that companies are successfully stuck with above market performance. Yes. But, but the order of magnitude, um, like, um, like, and like significantly higher profits is frequently possible, mm -hmm. right? So what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's, it's exactly that. If you are making money and you are making more money than most of the other companies, people, professionals you're competing against, you're a happy camper. But it's very probable, not even possible, that the way you're doing it, the, the, the market you're targeting, the way you're targeting them, the offers you're making, the uh, ways you're monetizing it, the what you're doing or not doing to extend or expand or perpetuate that sh that monetization is a fraction of a fraction of what's really possible from the time, the opportunity, market access, 
advertising, interaction. And when you realize how many better ways you can do it, it's very possible to make ads produce. I mean, there's plenty of research. I have lots of case studies. You can make an ad double, redouble, redouble. It's either quantitative or qualitative or both quantitative and qualitative result, meaning you can get an ad to do up to 21 times more more yield, more results, more response, more numbers. If you know how to do headlines, risk reversal, positioning changes, credibility, value creation, uh, uh, proof elements, bonuses, uh, you can convert more people when you get a prospect. You can get people to buy more at the point of sale. You can get them to buy longer. You can get them to buy things from you even if you don't have more than one product to sell by making partnerships. You can penetrate lots of different markets. You can not just go to media or not just knock cold on doors. You can find all kinds of companies, influencers, media, organizations, associations that have access to the same market and partner with them. You can take methodology that you have perfected that you only use in one market or in one application and license, partner, profit share, saving share with us. I go on and on and on, but those are a few. Yeah. And so what do you think, I guess, is the reason that like quite a lot of companies aren't like thinking like this or they don't even consider this? Like, is it because of like they're stuck in their vertical and they're having a look at their competition and they're going for kind of incremental mostly, improvement? Mostly. And, and most people are trained to default towards one source of revenue. They're trained to accept results as given. Uh, a lot of people in business, they focus most of their time on bringing a buyer in, not on how to make the buyer more profitable or find a lot more um, residual value, ongoing uh, profit from that relationship. Most people are trained in very um, in very traditional revenue generating thinking. They don't look at alternative ways to accomplish it. Most people don't realize you can have multiple approaches going concurrently. Most people who get a lot of their business from things like uh, word of mouth or referral don't recognize, they, they accept it as organic, reactive, episodic, intermittent. Re, re, they don't realize they could have up to 125 different strategic, proactive, systematic ways to get a lot more referrals. I mean, it's just a lot of things, Alex. And so what do you... Like, like, are there a few things or like, what does it take for a company to become truly great? Like the FedExes of the world, right? You know, so what does that take for a company? Well, it takes, it, it takes a lot and it takes a little. You have to understand what I call the strategy of preeminence, <laughs> which is to establish your product company people in the eyes of the target audience as the only viable solution, the most trusted advisor for life, the only source they could possibly go to or choose. In order to deliver on that, you have to be willing to give them advice that is different and more relevant. You have to be able to understand and express and articulate and verbalize what they really want more of, less of, the reason why they're trying to really get what it is you offer, your product or service does for them in a better, clear, more powerful way that resonates other than other people. You have to uh, see yourself as uh, somebody who has a moral responsibility, an obligation, and the privilege to try to help everyone in the market that you can serve better than your competitors, not because you want to be the most successful, but you want to be the most Im impactful and make and create the most value for your audience market. You got to look at your role in the market on many dimensions. Uh, I think uh, I, I tell people you have to see the relationship you have with the buyer and have them be seen as a client, not a customer. And the reason why I think in Australia they do more of that actually. But if you look at a uh, definition of a customer, it's somebody who buys a commodity or service. If I call you a customer, I'm saying, hey. Alex, I'm no better than a generic commodity or a service. If you look at somebody 
uh, uh, who, who is a client, the definition of that is somebody who's under the care, the protection, the well-being of another. Uh, if you're going to be preeminent, you have three categories of clients you have to serve. The first and the, and the primary one are certainly the ones who pay you. The other two are the people you pay, your employees, your team members, your colleagues, and your advisors. You have to be committed to grow and develop them and their success. You want everyone to be collaborative. You don't want to just squeeze everything you can out of people. You want to grow and develop everything you can within them. So their value, their contribution, their passion, their their uh, their collaboration is is off the charts. But those are a few things.